What is a dinosaur? Welcome to the Natural History of Dinosaurs. My name is Benjamin Berger. I'm a paleontologist teaching at Utah State University in the heart of Utah's dinosaur country in Vernal. The term dinosaur has lately been misused by the general public to mean anything fossil or anything with scaly skin, sharp teeth, and is extinct. But the truth is, is that dinosaurs are a very, very specific group of animals. They're nested in a monophyletic branch on the tree of life. In this video, we will explore the relationship of dinosaurs to other vertebrate animals and the characteristics that unite dinosaurs into each of these hierarchical groupings through shared morphological characteristics. Now we're going to start with a very large branch on the tree of life. The initial characters that unite a large monophyletic group of animals we call the chordata. Now members of the chordata are called the chordates and they exhibit the following characteristics. They have a notochord or stiff cartilaginous rod that gives support to the nerve cord that runs down the axis of the body, which is called the dorsal nerve cord. Now they also have muscle segments that run along the body and contract with signals from this nerve cord. Now the first members of the chordates appear during the Cambrian, about 520 to 500 million years ago, from sites like the Mao Tian Shea shales in China and the Burgess Shale in North America. Now members of primitive chordates are still alive today, including the lancelet, also called Amphioxus, placed within the genus Brachiostoma. Now these are actually placed within a more restrictive group of chordates called the cephalochordata because they have well, sort of a head. Now unlike sea squirts, which are the euchordata, the head end is where they filter food out of the water in shallow marine shorelines, and they dig into the sand using their segmented muscles. Richard Owen, when he named dinosaurs, was well aware that they belonged within this group. This is his sketch of the ancestral early chordate. Now, before this, we knew very little about evolution. And so he kind of referred to this diagram as basically a blueprint for building a vertebrate animal, which is the next branch in the tree of life. You know, this sketch does look a little, a lot like our friend Amphioxus, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? The next branch off the tree of life that dinosaurs belong to are the vertebrae or vertebrates. Now all members of this group have ossified their vert vertebra, uh, yet between these ossification centers they still retain the notochord, which is the inner vertebral discs that are found between the ossified or the hard bony centrums of the vertebrae. Now all fish, sharks, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals belong to this group. Now several primitive members lack the ossification of the notochords, such as lampreys and hagfish, but they have more developed heads and are, and are placed within this group. Now, strangely enough, they lack jaws, so they're grouped in a paraphyletic group called the agnatha. Now, note that this group is a paraphyletic group because it does not include animals with jaws that originated from the jawless fish group. Now, the next monophyletic group are the tetrapoda, or tetrapods, which means four feet. Now this group includes all animals that have four limbs and does not include sharks and fish. Now some members of the tetrapoda, such as snakes and amphisbanians, these are legless lizards, and sicilians, these are legless amphibians, they all lack legs, but share other characteristics with the legged tetrapods that indicate that they ancestrally had limbs which were lost independently through convergent evolution. So we include these in this monophyletic group, tetrapoda. Tetrapods first arose during the Devonian period, around 370 million years ago from lobed finned fish called sarcopterygians. Now one group of tetrapods developed a really unique reproductive trait that allowed these tetrapods to flourish on land and move away from water for reproduction. And that trait is the amniote egg. Now this group of tetrapods which, which laid eggs with hard shells are called the amniota. 
and they include reptiles, birds, and mammals. The ambion is a special membrane for the developing embryo that protects it. Now, during development, the embryo uses the yolk sac for nourishment, and waste is deposited in a sac called the allo allotus. In most mammals, the embryo is retained inside the mother with a reduced yolk sac and nourishment provided through a placenta, except for the egg-laying mammals, the platypus and echidnas. However, all mammals are considered members of the amniota, since their ancestors likely were egg-laying animals. Now with fossils, we do have fossil eggs, including fossilized eggs of dinosaurs. But in determining who is a member of the amniota, there are other characteristics in the skull and limbs that indicate that they are more developed for life on land. Amniotes appear in the fossil record during the Middle Pennsylvanian, about 300 million years ago. One of the first groups of amniotes are the capurinids. These were small lizard-like reptiles that lived in the dense forests during the Pennsylvanian period. Now the early amniotes split into three groups based on the openings in the back of the skull for jaw muscles. Early amniotes had weak muscles for closing the jaw. These early amniotes are called the anapsid reptiles and they included the capurinids. Now over time, some amniotes developed stronger jaw muscles to catch more food with their snapping jaws. Now to make room for these jaw muscles, some developed an opening above the jugal bone called the lower temporal opening, which allowed a large muscle to pass through called the temporalis muscle. You, right there sitting there, you have a temporalis muscle and a temporal opening on your own skull. Now, let's test it out. Take your hands and feel along the side of your head as you open and close your jaw. As you rest your hand on the jugal bone, this is the cheekbone right here, you will not feel any movement, any muscle underneath that. The hard bone is right there, that's your jugal bone. Now, open and close your jaws, and as you do so, uh, take your hand and lift it up just above the jugal, and suddenly, right there, you'll start feeling movement. And that movement right there, that's your temporalis muscle, which attaches from the sides of your skull to the back of your lower jaw. Now contracting this muscle, it's going to close your jaw. And you're a member of this new group of amniotes that have a single opening. We're called the synapsids, which includes many mammals, but they also include many extinct creatures like Dimetrodon, which are often mistaken as dinosaurs by the general public. Now another group of amniotes went a step further and they developed two openings for the jaw muscles, a lower temporal opening and an upper temporal opening. Now in this group, there are two sets of muscles that attach along the margins of these two openings. The adductor mandibular posterior muscle attaches to the lower temporal opening and the adductor mandibular externus attaches to the upper temporal opening passing over the adductor mandibular posterior muscle externally. Now both of these muscles adduct or close the jaw. Now this group of animals with two openings are called the diapsida and they include lizards, snakes, crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. And there's some debate whether it includes turtles. Now turtles lack any opening in the back of the skull for muscles. So if they are members of the diapsid, it would mean that they lost the two openings and returned to a more primitive condition of having the muscles that close the jaw attached to the back of the skull rather than passing through uh, openings. Now all dinosaurs clearly have two openings in the posterior part of the skull and clearly belong to the diapsida monophyletic group. Now we come to a split in the branch of the diapsida. One that includes the Leptosauromorpha, which includes lizards and snakes, and the Archosauromorpha, which includes crocodiles, pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and birds. The Archosauromorpha all share the characteristic of having an extra opening anterior or in front of the orbit or eye socket. Now this opening is called the antorbital fenestra. Now the antorbital fenestra is an opening to lighten the skull and likely held beneath it a pneumatic air sac which is found in living birds. 
Larry Whitmer at Ohio University studied in detail the anaerobial fenestra in dinosaurs and showed that it likely supported a pneumatic nasal sinus that aided breathing. There are some dinosaurs like Iguanodon that have a reduced anaerobial fenestra. Living crocodilians lack the anaerobial fenestra, although a number of fossil crocodilians had an anaerobial fenestra, which was lost when they became adapted to an aquatic lifestyle. Another trait that unites the archosauromorpha as a group as a group is a mandibular fenestra. This is an opening in the lower jaw. Now this trait is found in dinosaurs, it's found in primitive pterosaurs, some birds, and crocodilians. Now the opening provides an attachment for the adductor mandibular posterior muscle and the intermandibularis muscle. This is a 3D model of an alligator skull and jaw muscles published by Casey Holliday and colleagues at the University of Missouri in the journal Polis One. Here we see in dark blue the adductor at mandibular externus. And beneath this muscle we see in green the adductor mandibular posterior muscle. The pink muscle is the intermandibularis muscle that attaches within the enlarged mandibular fenestra. Another uh, orange muscle, very large muscle, can be seen uh, called the pterygoideus, which attaches from the lower jaw to a wide region in the base of the skull anteriorly. Each side of the lower jaw sits in a swing, and when these muscles contract, the jaw snaps closed. The hot pink muscle in the back is the depressor mandibular, which opens or depresses the lower jaw. The archosauromorph has some additional traits that unite them as a group, which can be seen in this illustration of a skeleton of a primitive member called Euparcaria. Now, Euparcaria is known from some really good material from the Middle Triassic of South Africa and Europe. Its teeth are in sockets, unlike lizards and snake teeth. This condition is called Thecodont. And when I was young, this group of ancestors to dinosaurs were called the Thecodonts which is no longer used since it's a paraphyletic group and it doesn't include the later members of that branch. Now Euparcaria likely was quadrupedal, walking on four legs, but it could run for short distances on its hind legs, a bit like the bipedal running in basculus lizards. Now to help with this fast running, they also developed a protuberance on the femur called the fourth trochanter which in life was an attachment site for a large muscle called the caudal femoris longus, which attached along the caudal vertebrae and neural and hemal arches. When contracted, this muscle allowed these muscles to kick back their upper leg and facilitate fast running. There are two more traits to this group, uh, an impedance matching middle ear, which uh, meant that they all had a better system for hearing using a large ear bone, and pneumicity, in the vertebra, which are basically holes or spaces found along the centrums, which in life would be filled with this complex air sac system. We'll talk more about the strange way members of the Archosauromorpha, including dinosaurs, breathe using an air sac system later on in a separate video. All right, next along the tree, we come to another split in the branches, one to a monophyletic group called the Curatarsali, which includes crocodilians, but also many extinct animals that often get mistaken for dinosaurs, and a group called the Avi metatarsali, which includes pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and birds. Now the difference between these two monophyletic groups is in the condition found in the ankle bones. Now remember, there are two bones in the ankle, the astragalus, which lays below the tibia, and the calcaneum, which lays below the fibula. In curatarsali, the major ankle joint is between the astragalus and calcaneum, which is sort of a, a ball and socket sort of joint. This causes the feet to swivel outward when walking. Now this is called the crocodile normal ankle because it is found in living crocodilians. In AV metatarsali, the major ankle joint is between the metatarsal bones and the astragalus calcaneum. Often the astragalus and calcaneum become fused to the tibia and fibia in this group. The ankle is much more upright, and this is called the crocodile reverse ankle. Now next time you look at a mounted dinosaur in a museum, look at the hind legs. 
and note this mesotarsal joint. You will often see that the astragalus is fused onto the end of the tibia. This configuration forces the joint to move in what is called a sagittal plane. That's basically forward and back, but not side to side. All right, the next branch we come to in the tree before we come to dinosaurs is a group, a modified lip group called the Ornithodira. Now this group includes pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and birds, as well as some groups that fall out between dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are flying archosauromorphs that live throughout the Mesozoic and first appeared about the same time as the dinosaurs. Now this beautiful skull of the primitive early Jurassic pterosaur, illustrated by Sterling Nesbitt and David Hone, shows all the features of the skull, including a super large anorbital fenestra, a small mandibular fenestra, and the fecodont condition of the teeth in sockets. So pterosaurs are very closely related to dinosaurs. The earliest pterosaurs include Dimorphodon, bones of which extend back into the late Triassic. Recently, some bones have been discovered near uh, Vernal, Utah by a team of researchers from BYU. So what makes dinosaurs and birds different from pterosaurs? Well, it all has to do with the hip bones. Now remember the name for the hip socket? The acetabulum. It lays at the intersection of three bones the ilium on top, the pubis out front, and the ischium in back. Now dinosaurs have a open acetabulum. That's a big hole where these three bones come together. This trait allows dinosaurs to have a much more upright stance. Since the head of the femur projects into this hole, animals that lack an open acetabulum like pterosaurs had a more sprawling gait. All right, let's quickly review what a dinosaur is. First, it must have a notochord and a vertebral column. Second, it must have four limbs. Third, it must lay eggs with hard shells. Fourth, it must have two openings in the posterior part of the skull for the jaw muscles. Fifth, it must have an antorbital fenestra. Sixth, it must have a crocodile reverse ankle joint. And finally, seventh, it must have an open acetabulum. All right, let's test your knowledge. Let's see if we can identify some, some dinosaurs. Let's take a look at this example. All right, we have a vertebral column, check. Four limbs, check. Two openings in the back of the skull for jaw muscles, check. All right, we see a nice anorbital fenestra and a nice crocodile reverse ankle joint. And we see in the hip an open acetabulum. Nice job, this is a dinosaur. All right, let's check out a, another uh, animal. Let's see if this is a dinosaur. Well, this one also has vertebra, has four limbs, and two openings in the skull. It's got a nice anorbital fenestra in front of the skull. And yes, a nice crocodile reverse ankle joint that you can see illustrated down here. They're nearly fused, but wait, what about the hip? You'll notice that the acetabulum is closed. Now, despite looking just like a dinosaur, this creature is not a dinosaur. In a future video, we'll revisit this animal when we talk about the origin of dinosaurs. So as you can see, there is a very, very specific definition of what a dinosaur is and is not based on the anatomy. Note that dinosaurs are a monophyletic group that includes birds. And we'll talk more about the origin of birds in a later lecture. All right, we've covered a lot of material in this lecture. Be sure to summarize the diagnostic characters of the monophyletic groups discussed in this video and explain why dinosaurs belong to each monophyletic group. Also sketch out the features of the dinosaur skeleton that makes them unique among the crown group, Archosauromorpha. And finally, be able to construct a cladogram including mammals, lizards, dinosaurs, crocodiles, and birds. Label the anatomical characteristics that distinguish each grouping on a cladogram.